Welcome to another of the Sydney Institute's uh, virtual presentations. Uh, today we have uh, two eminent Australians well known to the Sydney Institute family. I'm Jacqueline Wilcox, I'm the Chair of the Sydney Institute and uh, it'll also be my pleasure today to be ringmaster with these two gentlemen. I'm also going to ask uh, some of the questions that you very kindly sent in, so thank you for that. Um, the Honourable Michael Kirby, AC CMG, retired High Court judge, eminent jurist, with many biographies attesting to his mark on uh, the canon of international and, uh, and Australian legal world, human rights, uh, our cultural experience, as well as education. Um, he is also a, uh, uh, an, an Anglican, a Sydney Anglican, and, and a monarchist. Now I mention that because our second speaker, also well known to us, is uh, Dr. Jared Henderson, who, um, unlike uh, the Honourable Michael Kirby, is a Melbourne Catholic and a Republican. And I think there is apparently that all says quite a lot between these two gentlemen. Jared, as you all know, is one of Australia's leading political commentators. He is also an author, a political scientist, a historian, and has written many books about notable Australians and many of the events that uh, have affected our life here in Australia. Jared is also, uh, for, the, for more than 30 years, as you all know, the executive director of the Sydney Institute, and he has, uh, he's probably the main reason that our institute is preeminent in leading public discussion in, in this country, which now leads me to our first speaker, Michael Kirby. Thank you very much for having me again at the Sydney Institute, and thank you for uh, Jared Henderson's agreement to have this little discussion, a friendly little discussion, between us in relation to our uh, very different upbringing experiences. Uh, and uh, it is appropriate to start with my parents because uh, virtually every person's religious experience begins with their, their parents and with the uh, religious um, uh, indoctrination or experience that uh, their parents share with them at a very young age. It therefore becomes something very precious and very memorable to them as they grow older. Uh, my parents met at uh, St. Martin's Church, Martin, a great strong name there is, uh, at um, Kensington in Sydney. Uh, and um, that was a sort of symbol that uh, they were destined to grow up uh, and raise their children in the Anglican Church, uh, then called the Church of England. Uh, and. Um, my father was quite um, a, a devout, uh, I would certainly say observant Anglican, uh, and um, my mother less so. My father had been born uh, of a Catholic father um, who really neglected him greatly and therefore his mother raised him as an Anglican. And that was one of the divisions that was then created uh, in his side of the family. Um, he uh, was church attending uh, and um, he uh, actually took my name from St James's Church in Sydney where there is a window uh, to St Michael. There's one to St Michael and one to St George and uh, he took my name Michael because uh, I was about to be born on the 17th of March, 1939, and that was St. Patrick's Day, and that would have been a very bad day for me to arrive because uh, my father was then insisting that I would be called Michael. My mother, a child of Ulster, uh, was insistent that I would not be called Michael over my dead body, she is reported to have said. Anyway, I held off until the 18th of March, so there was no problem in picking up the name uh, he, he saw on his knees in St. James. Wonder how many young fathers go to church today and pray um, and contemplate and take their names of their children 
from a, a church window. Anyway, my father was quite observant during uh, much of his life. In the end, he was going to the Holy Trinity Church at Concord West, uh, near where our family home was in Concord in Sydney. Uh, but uh, the minister of that church, in tune with the Sydney Anglicans, then started to turn his attention from our blessed saviour to uh, homosexuals and started to denounce uh, homosexuals. And my father, along with other congregants, left the church and didn't return. My mother um, was not really very observant. Um, she had four children to raise and that was quite enough as far as she was concerned. Uh, and she raised us with uh, love uh, and devotion. Uh, but she had one big message from her upbringing, which was the message of Ulster. She had been born uh, in Berwick in Victoria, but her father and mother had come out as migrants to Australia. They were part of the Irish uh, diaspora, but uh, they were not Catholic Irish, they were Protestant Irish and very Protestant they were. My mother's sister, Marguerite, um, had gone to another part of the empire, Tanganyika, now Tanzania, uh, and she had met Dr. Flynn, uh, an engineer, and uh, had married him, uh, and the only problem was that he was a Roman Catholic. Uh, that led to uh, his, uh, Marguerite being um, uh, removed from the family. Uh, she was not um, acknowledged, there was no correspondence entered into, uh, and uh, only once a year on Marguerite's birthday would her father, my mother's father, my grandfather, raise his glass uh, to Marguerite. Uh, that was the kind of divisions that existed in the Ulster um, Protestants uh, and was brought by William uh, Knowles, my mother's father. Uh, this uh, was something which, uh, in an indirect sort of way, my mother conveyed to me. Uh, it was not dogmatic and it was not impious, but when she was ironing, she would talk about her family and she would talk about uh, the uh, great wrongs of Rome. This Obviously, this had been inculcated in her uh, by her parents, mostly by her father, uh, and um, therefore she uh, would insist upon my understanding that uh, the Catholic Church was um, not really a good force for the Christian faith, uh, it had superstitious views, uh, it was um, very autocratic, uh, and uh, it uh, had a lot of very strange habits. Now, all of this uh, I received with wide-eyed amazement because uh, in my school life and even in my neighbourhood, I really never met Catholics. Because they had their own system of education, uh, they went off to Catholic schools. We would see them going to Strathfield Railway Station uh, dressed in navy blue um, outfits uh, and um, we really had nothing to do with them. If I asked did I know and dislike Catholics, did I call out to them at school or anything of that kind, the answer is definitely not. <clears throat> we just had no uh, contact and they were a kind of sect that uh, was not really relating to my Australia and my neighbourhood and uh, the local uh, churches to which I went. Uh, I originally went to a Methodist church because to go to the Anglican church meant crossing Parramatta Road and that was too dangerous according to my mother and so up the street I went to the Wesley Methodist Church which is still there in Concord. It's now a Korean church but uh, it had wonderful hymns. I've never forgotten the Wesleyan hymns uh, 
Uh, and uh, the Anglicans have reasonable, though rather slow and often dirge-like hymns, but uh, and the Catholics have terrible hymns because they only got them really late in the piece, but the Methodists have the great hymns of Charles and John Wesley, and I took that uh, message as I went down to uh, St Andrew's Anglican Church. I sang in the choir, uh, and I saw the features of Anglicanism. Uh, we may not be the biggest church because listening to Dr. Rumble uh, and his question box uh, on Sunday nights on my uh, crystal uh, radio set, uh, I did learn that the Roman Catholic Church was f a far bigger church than the Anglican but um, we had the Anglican Church and the King um, was um, the governor of the Anglican Church, um, though not its ruler, and uh, the Anglican Church was a very Protestant church. I know, uh, and Gerard Henderson is very observant of this, that uh, the Anglican Church is uh, a sort of halfway house between Protestantism, strictly so-called, and uh, Catholicism, uh, and claims itself to be a Catholic uh, church, part of the Catholic church, uh, but uh, the, um, the Anglican church that I knew was almost a Baptist church. Uh, there were no, there was no incense there was no genuflection, there were no statues, there were no uh, representations of the Virgin Mary. In fact, the Virgin Mary was never mentioned, uh, and the mentions of the Virgin by the Roman Catholics was regarded as really heretical and elevating Mary into a position she did not enjoy in the Bible and should not enjoy uh, in church practice. Uh, the uh, altar was very plain and bare. Uh, if you look at most Sydney Anglican churches, the cross is bare. It's bare to represent the risen Lord. The Lord has left the cross and lives amongst us. So uh, my church tradition was Anglican, but Protestant. And that is the church tradition of the Sydney diocese. Uh, many people in the Sydney Diocese wish I would drop my association with the Anglicans, um, but Protestant Anglicanism was my tradition and it was what uh, was comfortable for me. Uh, and uh, the relationship to the state was symbolised. Uh, it's true that in many churches, <coughs> the old banners of uh, decommissioned regiments hang, but in St Andrew's Church at um, Concord uh, had the, the, the two big flags over the altar. There was the uh, Union Jack uh, and the Australian flag. And this was a sort of symbol that uh, as some people put it, Anglicanism, it said, is the Conservative Party of prayer. Well, I'm not so sure about the Conservative Party, but it was a, a certainly a, a place which resonated with Englishness and with the Book of Common Prayer and with the beautiful uh, liturgy of Cramner's uh, prayers. And uh, all of this was part of my upbringing. At school, I would attend the scripture classes. All my uh, schooling was in public schools, and therefore I inherited the great tradition uh, nationwide in Australia of uh, secular, uh, free and compulsory education. And the schools were very careful not to introduce party politics, and not uh, to introduce religion. Uh, there was no singing of hymns at school except for the one period a week uh, which had been dedicated in the 1870s to religious instruction. And I went to the Anglicans, who were the biggest 
So you'll understand I had the flags on the altar, uh, the Protestant tradition, uh, the biggest scripture class in my school, and I just never met Roman Catholics. And uh, that was just the experience to a very large extent um, that was brought to Australians by the separate education in Catholic schools. When I got to university, suddenly all of that was over. Suddenly there were all the children who had come up through the Catholic schools and we were thrust together. And that was uh, something which I found very healthy and I, I enjoyed that. And I uh, there met a, a young uh, student in the arts degree uh, who later accompanied me when I went to the law degree, Murray Gleeson. He was uh, a pupil from St Joseph's College, uh, a Catholic college in Sydney, and he set it uh, in his mind to try to convert me to Catholicism. Uh, he introduced me to his teachers who had been religious. He would uh, have dinner with them, and I would be brought along, and he gave me books about the Catholic Church. One of them was a very, very serious mistake on his part because it was a book on the Vatican, and it showed what a, a cesspool of plotting and scheming the Vatican was. So that wasn't a very good thing for my path to Catholicism. And I told him, Murray, you're wasting your time on this. I'm certainly not going to take instruction and I'm certainly not going to join your church. Later, uh, I found that my own church, the Anglicans, the Sydney Anglicans, especially in more recent times, was becoming really quite nasty to LGBT people, uh, as the Catholic Church was. I just assumed, well, the Catholics always do their own thing and they've got these wrong uh, attitudes, but the Anglicans shouldn't have that. They should be rational and Protestant, but the Sydney Anglicans are very anti-gay and therefore that was not very pleasant. But uh, my partner, Johan, who is from the Netherlands, was not a Calvinist, as many now Netherlanders are. He was nothing. He didn't believe in anything. He couldn't believe that an intelligent person like me would have any belief, Catholic, Protestant, Anglican, or any of them. Uh, but uh, I have adhered to my uh, belief as an Anglican. I was invited by the Australian Rationalist Society to become one of their patrons, um, along with uh, Gareth Evans and others. Uh, and I said to them, well, I have to warn you that I am an Anglican. And that set them into great and deep consternation and pondering. But ultimately, they agreed that they would accept a person who was uh, an Anglican. Uh, and uh, I'm therefore uh, a very happy and proud patron of the Australian Rationalist Society. I think you can be a rationalist uh, and uh, you can be a Christian. Uh, you can even possibly at a stretch be a Sydney Diocese Anglican Protestant Christian. Uh, whether you can be a rationalist and a Catholic, I think there's a very big question, but I will leave that to Gerard Henderson to uh, analyse and answer. But um, I thank uh, the Sydney Institute for having this discussion. I'm not sure that a lot of what I've said would be relevant or understood fully by young Australians, Anglican, Catholic or otherwise today. Uh, the things that worried me with Dr. Rumble and his question box would not worry many young people today. Uh, however, uh, all of us are to a very large extent uh, the products of our parental upbringing. And I have told you my story uh, and I don't think it would be all that different to many people of the 1940s and 50s uh, and uh, the story is continuing but I haven't abandoned my 
religious beliefs and to be honest I'm quite proud and happy to be an Anglican. It now uh, ordains women priests, it now consecrates women bishops, uh, it has consecrated gay bishops uh, and it is uh, in dialogue worldwide about the issue of LGBT rights and that is not yet happening in the Roman Catholic Church. But uh, happen it will, uh, because that is what is required by a rational view of our existence and by uh, the beliefs in uh, the Christian faith. So we thank um, Michael Kirby for that um, interesting uh, presentation and I'm now going to introduce uh, Jared Henderson. Well thanks Jacqueline and thanks to Michael. It's a bit hard coming after Michael but I've got the idea I'm sort of here to represent someone who would never qualify to belong to the rational society which from which I assume I'm speaking from a kind of irrational perspective which I'm quite happy to do today. Now Michael is as you would have heard a, a man of the Protestant Reformation um, and I think it's probably fair to say that I'm a kind of counter-reformation guy um, but that's where we differ I guess. Now I'll follow Michael and say a bit about myself. I don't like talking about myself much but I'll say a few words. I, I was born in September 1945. I was christened at Our Lady of Good Counsel Church in Deep Dean in Melbourne um, and I got a great name, Jared Henderson. And I'll tell you why it's a great name because there are very few of them around. And the reason why there are very few Jared Hendersons around, or like my sister Veronica, and there are very few of them around. My brother Paul, there are a few of them around. The reason why there are very few Jared or Veronica Hendersons around, it's a combination of a Catholic first name and a Protestant surname. So how did this come about? Well, uh, my father's father was a Protestant, um, and my father my father's mother was a Catholic, so my father was brought up a Catholic, but his father was a Protestant, uh, and my mother, who had essentially an Irish background, was brought up a Catholic, and my father's background was essentially Scottish. Um, so I think when I add it all up, um, my background is about 60% Irish and about 40% Scottish, but no English or Welsh. Um, I also should point out that Jared is a patron St. Gerard is St. Gerard Magella, who is listed as the patron state of expectant mothers, but I've always referred to him as the patron state of neurotic mothers, and I once said that to um, Gerard uh, Noonan, who was the editor of the Sydney Morning Herald, and he took great offence, so I've decided not to repeat it except here today. Uh, I, grew up, I grew up in Whitehorse Road, Baldwin. Up the hill was Reed Street, and there it was that Robert Menzies lived for about four years before he became Prime Minister. He moved from Howard Street in Kew to Reed Street in Baldwin. And I remember riding my tricycle past the house and it was usually called, my mother used to took us on trike rides or my father would, would refer to it as the Menzies house, although by then, by then he was Prime Minister living in, in the lodge. M M Baldwin was a rather Protestant area it was part of the greater area of Camberwell, which until very recently um, uh, was alcohol-free area. There were no hotels where I grew up. Uh, and also, which um, we didn't follow very much, but there was no sport on Sunday either. The Protestant Council at the Camberwell Council ruled out drinking at any time and sport on Sunday. So we, we grew up in a quite different tradition to that. Um, as far as I recall, the, the famous uh, person of roughly my generation from Camberwell is Barry Humphreys, who's written about his background and his book and refers to his mother as uh, a bitter anti-Catholic um, and a terrible snob. Um, I went to Burkhall, which was the Xavier College Preparatory School, and then to Xavier College. Uh, Barry Humphreys went to Melbourne Grammar, and about 20 years ago I criticised um, criticised one of Barry shows, although I'm a, quite a fan and have been for years, but I thought on this one he was pretty hard on the Irish and pretty hard on the Catholics and uh, I wrote that and subsequently Barry was interviewed by the Herald Sun in Melbourne and the journalist asked him 
she asked him why he uh, was not spending much time in Australia. And Barry said he wouldn't come here because uh, whenever he did, I criticised him. And then the journalist said, why would that be, Mr Humphreys? And Barry replied, oh, because Gerard Henderson went to Xavier College and I went to Melbourne Grammar. And then in a sense, there was some kind of truth in that, in that quick response. Growing up Catholic, and like Barry Humphreys, unlike Michael Kirby, um, we didn't look to Buckingham Palace, we looked to Rome. Uh, we, we respected the Queen, uh, but we didn't look to the Queen. Our local hero was Daniel Mannix, he was the Archbishop of Melbourne, he was an Irishman, came out here um, at around the age of 50 uh, from uh, Maynooth near Dublin. Um, and took on the Protestant establishment in Melbourne on a whole range of issues from uh, education to um, conscription during the First World War um, to the status of Ireland. Um, and someone asked me once to explain Daniel Mannix's philosophy and I put it this way, I have to do it visually. I said essentially it was doing that to the Protestant establishment in Melbourne. Now that was certainly true in his early days. By the time he became an older man, I'm talking here about the, the 40s and the 50s, and he dies in 1963. That's not the case, but it is certainly the case in his period here from, from, um, from around 1915 through to about 1935. That was certainly his position. Um, I still remember the coronation of 1953, I was seven, so I went, we, were at, we always went to Sunday Mass, and. Our house was full of holy pictures and pictures of the saints and lots of pictures about uh, Mary. I mean, it would have been... Look, we're into idolatry, Mark. <laughs> it's the kind of thing that anything, anything that Cromwell drove out of the churches um, in, in England, I think probably found their way to our place and we stuck them up on the wall. <laughs> we, were, we were all into that. Um, and, of course, um, whilst we didn't look to the Queen in London, we looked to Pope Pius XII, who, as I, can work, as I can work it out, as a kind of theological scholar every now and then, was the last Catholic Pope, I think, but we, we looked to Pope Pius XII. And I mentioned the coronation of 1953. I still remember, as I said, going down to Our Lady of Good Counsel and the parish priest, Father Goodwin, gave us a lecture. It was before television, of course, but there were a lot of newspapers in Melbourne, very good newspapers in Melbourne, and uh, there was radio, of course, and he said to us, he said, look, you can, and there was also the news items on the on the hourly shows where you could go to a cinema and see see moving pictures of news. And he said, "Look, show an interest. Show an you can show an interest in the coronation." He said, which was in Westminster Abbey. He said, "But just remember," he said, "it was our church originally." <laughs> and I've always sort of followed that. I think he was right. It was stolen from us, and um, it was only 450 years later. But I mean, he had a good memory and. Uh, you know, what's half, a, what's half a millennium when it comes to these important matters? So there was, the, there was the Pope in Rome who was Italian, and the saints and the martyrs were essentially all what would be called in those days foreigners, uh, apart from the English martyrs. Um, and uh, in our school at Burke Hall, and the junior school, that uh, uh, we had various houses, and two of them were named after the English martyrs, uh, Edmund Campion. The real Edmund Campion, not the Sydney version, the, the real thing Edmund Campion, he was a martyr, and um, Robert Southwell and I was in the Southwell house team, and we're very proud of Southwell, he, he was also a martyr. So we sort of looked up to the martyrs, um, and it took them a long time to become saints. Uh, Edmund Campion wasn't canonised until 50 years ago this year, in 1970, and so it took a long time, but, but we thought he should have got there earlier, but Rome was being nice to London at the time, and. Uh, and he wasn't, he didn't make it. Now then there was the other side of it. Um, we didn't bury, I didn't know any Protestants, uh, non-Catholics like Michael, until I got to university, but like Michael, we didn't bear any, any, any animosity, and our secular religion was the Essendon football team, uh, which was very successful in the late 40s through the 50s, and uh, not so much in the last 20 years, but that was essentially a Protestant team. Um, with a very strong Masonic Lodge influence. There were a few not so successful players who came out of the Young Christian Workers' Movement, which was a Catholic movement, but um, all, all the key figures were Protestant, and all my <coughs> heroes, Bill Hutchinson and John Coleman and Wally May and uh, 
Norm Macdonald is an indigenous player. I'm not sure about Macdonald's background, but all the others are Protestant. And, um, and also we followed the cricket. And there, there had been great tension in the, in the team between the Catholics uh, led by Bill O'Reilly and the Protestants led by Don Bradman. That wasn't so evident in Australian rules football. At any rate, we, it didn't matter much to us, but I didn't mix to, um, with um, non-Catholics till I got to university. But in our home, as I know people of my generation, and I think, I think this is true of John Howard, I think he told me once that it was common um, for that kind of Australian to refer to Britain at home. We never referred to Britain at home. We, we didn't have a home uh, in a sense. We only had Australia because uh, we, we weren't Italian, so we, we didn't have a home there. And we weren't Irish because after the Irish Civil War, a lot of the Irish in Australia lost interest in the conflict there. Uh, and uh, we were sent, so we weren't going to go back to Dublin anywhere, and we weren't going to go to Rome. We only had here, so our focus was here. And so, um, when the Royal Tour occurred in 1954, my father drove us into the city, and we looked at all the lights, and we saw the Queen go by. And even our school was taken down to see the Queen go by, uh, and that was all good fun. But we didn't. It was just good fun. I mean, to, uh, she was the head of the Church of England, and uh, we, we we didn't belong to that church. And I think it. it, it I don't think the Queen in Australia has ever visited a Catholic church, even to this day in Australia, and I think it's only done so on a couple of occasions in, in Britain. As to politics, uh, I grew up in a Labour family. My father regarded Ben Chifley as his great hero, uh, but of course the Labour split came in 1954-55. My father, along with thousands and thousands of good Labour people, were expelled, um, or they resigned, and so my father became a member of the Democratic Labour Party, uh, which gave its preferences to the coalition in essentially the Liberal Party and what was then called the Country Party. And that did sort of change the political climate in, certainly in Victoria because uh, whereas uh, the Liberals had been our political opponents, the Liberals became to our family a preferable government to a Labour government uh, and that pre went right through my young and teenage years. Um, and then the great breakthrough came because the Catholics in Australia always felt they were discriminated against, and in my view they were, because they didn't get state aid for their schools, uh, whereas a Protestant could go to a government school for nothing. If a Catholic wanted to go to a Catholic school, they had to pay money. Um, now I should say that Xavier College, where I went, is not the Xavier College of today because it had a lot of Jesuits in administration and teaching positions and the fees were much lower, but it was, a, it, it was what was called a public school or a, a, a what would now be called a, a well-known private school. Uh, and some people who had an experience coming up in Christian Brothers schools um, or women who were taught by the various orders of nuns would have a different experience to me. But we were common in one matter about state aid and the breakthrough came in 1950, 1963 when um, Bob Santa Maria, on behalf of the Democratic Labour Party, convinced the Menzies government to give a limited form of state aid at the Commonwealth level and this was followed in a similar way in 1967 at the state level and so by the end of 1967 the great grievance that we'd grown up with as during our, during our younger years had disappeared and matters changed a lot. In those days and until probably the last 30 years there was only usually one Catholic and Liberal Party government in the cabinet, it would be one, uh, that went through right through until the the end of the Fraser government, really, but not in recent times. There's probably an abundance of Catholics in the cabinet uh, of, a, of a Liberal Party government in recent years. So that's how we all ended up. When I got to university, um, I met a lot of non-Catholics, mainly in campus politics, and also met a lot of Jews. Uh, people have often asked me why, where my interest in Israel comes from, and I think um, I made a lot of friends with Jewish students at Melbourne University, but also with two academics of Jew who were Jews, uh, Hugo Wolfson um, and Frank Noffelmarker. And I think the reason why Jews and Catholics sort of found their way together was that because we were both minorities, Catholics were at any one time no more than 25%, Jews were less than 1%, fewer than 1%, and in a sense we were both sort of on the outside. In those days, Catholics weren't welcome in the Melbourne Club. Um, 
um, and nor were Jews. So we had a bit in common. We were both we were both excluded, which uh, made us a bit united. But by the time you get to the 1970s, virtually all of that kind of background that Michael's been talking about and I've been talking about begins to fade away. Except I would say one thing, um, I never tried to convert anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I would have succeeded. I don't think I was a strong enough believer. Um, but if I were trying to, I wouldn't have started with Michael. Uh, not with a Protestant Reformation guy, with a background in the Ulster struggles. Thank you. So thank you to both Michael and Jared for that. We'll now move to your questions. So you both um, finished your presentations at university and I would like to explore a little bit beyond that. So how, how is it that when you were entering that great period of tumult in Australia, um, how did your respective church associations and, and faith affect your roles in public discussion? I, I wouldn't say that in my case my church greatly affected my role. I mean, growing up the Anglican church was about 40% of Australians and it was the church that, though not established, was always first at public occasions and the Queen uh, went, uh, as uh, Gerard has pointed out, to Anglican church. She's a, a church attending Anglican or Scottish uh, in, uh, in Scotland. She goes to Presbyterian churches. But um, it, uh, I don't think the church had a big effect. Of course, the Labour split that was mentioned did have a big effect because uh, the consequence of that was that the Labour Party was out of office uh, really for, from 1949 until 1972, which is an awfully long time and that wasn't good for Australian political life, um, but that was one of the consequences of the role of religion in Australian life and the role of the DLP and uh, uh, and that was something which, if you were a Labour supporter at the time, as my father was, uh, you felt very uh, angry about that, that the churches were getting involved in, in the politics of the country. Mm. Jared, you, you also stopped your presentation at university. What about you, you and the discussions and, and the activism that you were involved in? Well, I just got actively involved in politics. I was with Bob Sandmarie's National Civic Council for about 10 years. We fell out in the end and for the last decades of his life we didn't speak, but uh, people regard me still as part of that. But, um, but that was essentially a political movement. It was a, a political movement of Catholics, but it was a political movement. Uh, there wasn't much Catholicism discussed. I, um, I mentioned my, I had a joke about Pius Twelfth as the last Catholic Pope and um, I was not a great fan of Vatican II, not because of the religious matters, but at the time the Catholic ch Church for a period threw out all its liturgy, mm. all its traditions, and they all disappeared. I mean, as, uh, I remember as he became Bishop Eric Darcy once saying that after Vatican II, to find the Catholic, to uh, find the tabernacle in a Catholic church, you had to create a royal commission to find it. He mm. said, and I just didn't like that very much. So gradually, I, I drifted away. I mean, I've always had this view about the Catholic Church, and uh, and Michael might disagree with me on this, but it's got its it's got its tr traditions, it's got its teachings, it's got its dogma, but no one's forced to belong to it. You can always walk away if you don't like the church's teaching on this or that. Just leave it. Uh, I just sort of part it on, on friendly basis. I don't have any problem with the church. I'd be regarded as a cultural Catholic, uh, but I was never a particularly a religious person, and I liked the traditions, and when the traditions went, uh, you know, I wasn't going to turn up and turn up in something that <coughs> looked like the Anglican church in, in Sydney, which was so low you couldn't see it. I wasn't really interested in that sort of church. Now, in more recent times, the Catholics brought back some of the traditions. So I'm not talking about the Catholic Church now. I'm talking about the Catholic Church in the late 60s through to the middle or the late 70s, which is when I sort of uh, 
started drifting away. Um, but I bear no antag antagonism towards the Catholic Church at all. I'm grateful for the education that I received, which was, I mean, ha all, everyone's education has some limitations, but it was a very good education. I learned a lot, and, and I admire the people who taught me, um, including the Jesuits and the lay people as well. So um, that was my background. We got no political indoctrination at our school at all. In fact, there was, I found out later that there was a nest of Labour people in the school. They all belonged to the Catholic Worker, which was a, which was a Catholic magazine in Melbourne, which opposed Santa Maria and Daniel Mannix, and were all, they're all in the Labour Party. Most of my lay teachers were members of, of the Catholic Worker. Frank, I mentioned Frank Knopfelmarker. Frank Knopfelmarker once lo joked that it shouldn't be called the Catholic Worker, it should be called the Catholic Senior Lecturer, mm -hmm. because there weren't any workers on it, which was true. They're all intelligentsia, they're all teachers and uh, lawyers and all that sort of stuff. But they sort of, they were a group within our school and we never got, neither the Jesuits who would have been with Daniel Mannix and the Democratic Labour Party, nor the lay teachers in the social sciences, they're all with the Labour Party, but we didn't get any indoctrination. Um, so I just, I got, I learned what I learned from home, really, not... I learned a lot of history at school, but I was never, we were never told how to vote. Now, it might have been different with people who went to schools run by the, the various orders of Mal brothers, it might have been, or nuns, I don't know. But we, we didn't get any indoctrination. And to me, I should make one point about the Labour split. I mean, the Labour split was called, essentially, because there was a Labour leader called Bert Evert, who lost the 54 election, which he should have won, turned on the Victorian executive and sacked the whole Victorian executive. The party split. My father was a, a loyal Labour man. He got expelled. So it was mainly the Catholics who got who were expelled, but it wasn't only them. Uh, and if, if, be, if, if Labour had had a different leader, the split wouldn't have occurred, and my background would have been quite different. But it, the split did occur. And it changed everything. Likewise, I think if I'd grown up in Sydney where the split didn't really take place, it mainly took place yeah, in Victoria and Queensland, if I'd grown up in Sydney, it would have had a different background as well. Would, would Sydney have, have produced a, a Mannix or a Santa Maria? I don't think so. Uh, and in fact, hearing Jared speak about his, his um, sort of religious and political upbringing is, is mildly shocking to me because in the public schools, there was an absolutely no discussion of party politics uh, and in church there was no discussion of it. I had a wonderful minister, because he didn't call himself a priest, though the Book of Common Prayer called him a priest, uh, at uh, St Andrew's Church uh, and his, his interest was the war. He had fought, he'd been a padre in the Second World War and so when others were talking uh, about uh, sex and um, abortion and things like that, he would invite people to come and speak at the church. He invited Pastor Niermöller, who was one of the Lutherans who stood mm. up against Hitler. And um, he spoke to our humble little church in the suburbs of Sydney. So that was the sort of um, religious milieu for me and it was not uh, an Australian political milieu and similarly um, at, um, at school we, we, we didn't get um, religion or politics, we got uh, excellent teaching and excellent values, democratic equal values and I think I feel a sort of resentment that I didn't meet any Catholics until I got to university. And this was by their own choice that uh, when Governor Burke had tried to have national schools as the British had tried to introduce in Ireland, um, that was opposed by the Catholic hierarchy and in Ireland and, and it was opposed in Australia. The countries that have very strong cohesion are New Zealand and the United States where they haven't had large separate religious denominational schools and I think it's <coughs> looking back I, I think it, it wasn't a good development for Australia but, but if you were it's a, happened if you were a Catholic, if you were a, an Anglican in Melbourne and you went to Church of England schools like Melbourne Grammar or Geelong Grammar you wouldn't have met 
you wouldn't have met any Catholics either. I mean, the, 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 the churches yeah, had their own schools. The just schools, I wouldn't. Yeah, but just that the Catholics had more schools than the Anglicans had, but they both had schools. Yes. Oh, I know that, but they were private schools. I'm talking about the great Australian experiment in compulsory, free and secular education, which over the last 30 or 40 years, we've been in the process of defunding or not properly funding. And that's, that's an outcome of all of this uh, ancient and often Irish uh, antagonism uh, to um, the system of public schools. But that's essentially because you came out of a major majority tradition, as you pointed out. The Anglicans were 40 percent, and there were other Protestants as well. Um, I came out of a minority tradition. Across Australia, the Catholics were probably 20 percent, so it's pretty obvious that the group that's in a minority is going to have a different attitude to the status quo than the group that's in the majority. Yes, but uh, though I came from the majority, I wasn't fed that at school. Um, but you might, have, you might have because of the the flag, you, you talked about the, the king was your king and the flags that were in the, in the but church. we didn't have icons at home <laughs> with little statues and, uh, and Did so you have on. a portrait of the king? Uh, no, no icons of the king. Um, I subsequently wrote to the British High Commission when I was about 13 and asked for a, a, a photograph of the Queen and they packed it up and sent it very nicely and I put that in my bedroom at, uh, <laughs> at home. But, but you can uh, still find today in Anglican churches, they've still got the Union Jack or the Union flag. Yeah. Uh, I mean, at school we didn't have the papal flag. We didn't have any flags. Yeah, but you had a photograph of the Pope uh, and well, you had a photograph in your church. But you talk, both talk about Catholics and, and Anglicans and not knowing each other until you got into university. But, and Jared, you mentioned Jews because you, you know, you, you had a natural affiliation being both in the, in the minority. Did you uh, encounter Jews in yes, Sydney? Yes, don't forget most Jews went to public schools and because they were secular and they were happy in the public schools. They, they went to non-scripture as it was called. When we, have, when we went off to our religious classes, and I'm not sure whether my high school there was a special religious class for the Catholics in the school, there weren't many of them, but there were some, but uh, the Jews would go off to non-scripture and they always did very well academically and, um, and so I knew a lot of Jews at school. Um, they were only 2% of the population, but mm. they were in public schools. Mm. But I have to say that at the end of my mother's life, see, my mother was the core of Ulsterdom. But at the end of her life, when she was dying in Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, there was not an Anglican priest or minister to be seen, but there was a very nice Catholic priest. His name was Father Brendan Quirk. And he was a friend of a Josephite nuns uh, community opposite my parents' home. And they asked him, because they'd been friendly with my mother, to go and call on my mother, and that he did. And when my mother was actually dying, the very day she died, Father Quirk came in and he said, I, I would like to say some prayers with your mother. Would that be all right? And I said, well, I'm not sure. That might upset her because her father was from Ulster. And my father my father was there and my mother just put her hands in prayer and signalling that she was over that she had passed beyond that and she didn't want at that moment to be denying uh, the opportunity of prayer uh, of a christian uh, priest and so he got out these oils and potions i assume they were that the extreme unction procedures of the Catholic Church, which we don't have in Anglicanism. And he did all that. And I was worried about Ulster. But my mother had grown up and really gave an, uh, gave an instruction that we've all got to grow up and get over this secular, uh, the, the uh, denominational differences because the essence of the similarities are so much greater. And that is, Jared, what... Uh, Vatican II taught. 
Mm. What about other denominations? What about the, 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 the Methodists uh, and now and the rise of Pentecostal and Pentecostalism that we're seeing here? Well, I don't think we really had much to do with Pentecostals. No, they went around recently. Yeah. But Methodists, the Methos and the present Presbyterian Buttons and so on, they were around in the public schools. Um, well, they were around the private schools too. Geelong College and Scotch College were Presbyterian. Wesley College in Melbourne was Methodist. Xavier College was Catholic, and the other two were Anglican. So but these were always minorities, you see. Well, they were minorities, but I'm just saying that. I mean, we met these people because we played sport against them. We played football and cricket against them. So, so I, I mean, I knew, I knew, I knew that, but. Um, we met them because they were part of our community. Let's make a point about Ulster. I mean, the Protestants dominated Ulster. The Catholics were the minority in Ulster. They were in the minority in Ulster, but yeah. they were in the majority elsewhere, and their fear was that uh, left to um, being just a minority in, in, in Ireland, they would suffer disadvantages that they didn't want to suffer. So, they but, did okay. but let us not go there, Jeremy. <laughs> my, they mother, did okay. my mother taught me to get over it and, and well, not to. And that's as Patrick O'Farrell's book on the Irish in Australia is very interesting yeah. because he teaches that when the later Irish came out to Australia and tried to sell the hatred of Britain and the dislike of uh, British institutions and so on. Um, the the uh, Irish in Australia were not all that sympathetic or supportive. Yeah, that's true. But in, in, in the in the sixties, though, so we're talking about the the, the split, the Labor split, um, and then we had all the movements coming up in the late sixties and seventies, you know, the anti-war and uh, women's rights and, uh, and late, latterly gay rights. What um, do, 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 is is that where faith? got involved in in your respective involvement in those causes? Well, so far as gay rights are concerned, you know, this is something where there was a unity ticket between the Catholic uh, Church and the uh, and the uh, Sydney Anglicans, at least. And and recently, uh, the, uh, the Archbishop uh, Fisher of the Catholic Church and uh, Archbishop Davies of the Anglican Church at New College sort of uh, engaged in a dialogue and they fell over themselves with agreement about everything. Um, and that really tested me, but I kept remembering Martin Luther and, and sort of expressing my view that this was an, an erroneous interpretation of the Bible and they should just uh, respond with the kindness and love, which is the essential message. This is the problem with denominationalism, that you get so bound up in your own loyalties, which are sort of clan loyalties, that you forget the central message of Christianity, which is one of love and reconciliation and, and peace and kindness to each other. That doesn't figure big on the, either the Ulster or the, um, the Republican uh, sentiment in Ireland. And were your experiences then, Jared, on the fringes of those discussions? Yeah, I never got involved. In, there were Catholic organisations on the campus of Melbourne. I never got involved. I wasn't. There was a Newman Society, and I had trouble understanding what some of them were talking about. Actually, I wasn't particularly. I was in history. I wasn't interested in theology. And as I said, my view was if you you didn't want to belong, you could always leave. I was find it odd all these people want to change the Catholic Church. You don't. You don't have to belong. You know, if I don't like something, I just walk away. I don't try and change it. By and large. That's hard if it's associated with your parents and with their faith and your loyalty to them. You, you just can't easily walk away from your church. And if you think it is in error, as for example, I think the Sydney Diocese and all the Baptist simplicities of it, uh, they are just taking a very narrow literalist interpretation. Well, now, I think my job is to try and convince them of their error. <laughs> uh, it may be presumptuous and it may be foolish and it may be a waste of time, but that's why people struggle with it and they, they love their church and they don't want it to go away from them. You're a kind of Protestant version of um, Murray Gleeson uh, uh, 60 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose that's, that's true, but... Uh, 
I, uh, I'm, I'm not actually trying to convert anybody, but I'm just trying to put the rational viewpoint. I mean, and I think nowadays most people embrace the rational viewpoint about women's rights and gay rights. You, you both talk about being from, for want of a better term, a mixed, mixed uh, religious um, affiliation in, in the family. You know, got history of Protestant, Protestants and, and Catholics. What about, and you mentioned in your personal life, your partner is not in any way religious. He's against it. <laughs> He's against it. But, Jared, you married a Catholic. Yes. And was, was that important in, in your early relationship I thought with she Anne? Was, I thought she was a pretty good sort, actually. <laughs> um, didn't really matter. I mean, we mainly, we mainly met Catholic women, I guess. Although Anne and I really met in a bookshop. It was a it was well it was a, it was a Catholic bookshop that was selling books schools texts it wasn't a religious bookshop um, I don't think that was look early on there was this concept of mixed marriages mm -hmm. and they were that was a marriage between a Protestant and a Catholic and they were they were allowed in the church but they were kind of frowned upon I, uh, it's uh, George Pell writes and Tess Livingston's book on George Pell because indicates this, George Pell's father was a Protestant, his, his mother was a Catholic, and so in Ballarat they weren't allowed to marry at the altar, they had to marry at the side of the altar, because mm. only Catholics could marry at the altar. That probably survived until probably the 1970s, it doesn't apply anymore. So there were concepts about that, but I wasn't particularly interested in all those church teachings. I mean. And what about Sundays? You talked about you know, going to the nearest church, which was the Methodist church, and so it was for you. Any, you, you did feel the need to go to church every Sunday, and and it uh, yes. well, from the Protestant. When I was growing up, as when Jared was growing up, uh, going to church was was much more regular than it is now in mm. in, in Australia, and uh, so I would go. And uh, but the Methodist experience was quite brief, and then I went to the local Anglican church. And I love the liturgy, and it really is very beautiful. It is, I understand, a, a sort of English translation of the Catholic Missal of that time, mm. but done by Cramner, who was not only a, a, a saintly man and brave and strong, but he was a great writer. And it's very, very beautiful. Um, and so I started to, to sing in the choir, but I, I used to faint. And in the end, my the, the minister padre said, "Well, Michael, you have a beautiful voice, but please, I don't think we can carry you out of church again. So, uh, just uh, have your private devotions." <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was discouraged from continuing. The fainting my choir effort. boy, yeah. I love yeah. it. Jared, was Sunday a big day for you? Well, you talked about in in Melbourne not having you couldn't play sport on Sunday. Well, in, drink. in in the Camberwell in the Camberwell uh, local government area, yeah. I mean, not all areas were like that, but where I grew up was in, in the Camberwell, the local government area in Baldwin, and that was that was the case. Look, um, didn't we didn't I mean we didn't follow it, but there weren't any organised sport on it in, in Camberwell at that time. You could you couldn't rent out an oval and play a football game on it on a Sunday. So um, I don't think there was anything like that in Sydney, no. though. Concord in Sydney yeah. was, was like your suburb in Melbourne. No pubs, no yeah. hotels at all. Mm. So we, uh, we just used to go to Mass on Sunday. Did you go to confession? Not seriously, no. Mm. As I said, I don't like talking about myself. So I used to make up a few sins and get absolved. It was all pretty easy. You, you made you up a few that? sins and you That's got something my mother warned areas. me about Catholics. They, they mm. think they can just go along to a human being and, and get absolved, whereas we know it's not as easy as that. We have to That's make our confession with all know. others yeah. to the Almighty and it'll be up to him, and God was a him, to decide whether or not we would be absolved. And as a young lawyer and, and then as a, as a judge, uh, the ritual that is in church is very similar to some of the ritual that is in court. Didn't and the dress and, and uh, a lot of the Englishness of the judiciary is partly inherited from the English um, uh, church and that in turn was inherited from the Catholic church. I mm. mean, uh, 
Uh, it's very ritual oriented. But I, I got a feeling, and I hope I wasn't wrong, that my church was a kind church, very English and kind. Uh, and um, now I get a feeling that it's not so kind. And both the Catholic and Anglican churches at the moment are very against transgender people. Now, I don't know a lot about transgender, but those I know, they really have a hard life and they don't deserve unkindness and unscientific approaches to their existence. But having, having said that, I would say that the Catholic Church of my generation was also a kind church. If you look at if you look at what the nuns in particular were doing in the hospitals and in teaching poor kids, if you look at later on, uh, uh, HIV AIDS patients are often looked after in Catholic uh, hospitals and institutions. Mm, that's uh, true. Mm. Um, I mean, George Pell, I know because I'm doing a book at the moment, used to go and, and visit some of these AIDS centres in Melbourne and no, no one knew about it. So whilst there was this one attitude to doctrine, um, the Catholic, I mean, Malcolm Muggeridge once said about the Christian churches in general. He wrote about India. He said when he went around India, he'd find all these orphanages and other places run by various Christian churches. He never found one but run one run by the Human Society or the Rational Society. So the Christians were doing all this, and the Catholics were doing a lot of the general Christian heavy lifting. So I think we we should we should not overlook that. I mean, if you if you're down and out in the gutter you're probably more likely to be picked up by a Christian believer than you are by someone who's not. Well, I think there's a lot of truth, truth. truth in that. The only problem is if you're in one of those who have been left in the gutter, like a gay person or uh, an injecting drug user or a sex worker or others in the categories that are not smiled upon, then life is quite difficult for you. And because it's being done to you by something you honour and cherish and want to embrace your church, it's particularly painful. That's, that's, the, that's the sort of conflict and problem. But I'm second to none in paying tribute to the Sisters of Mercy at St Vincent's Hospital and equivalents around Australia. They were wonderful when the AIDS epidemic came along, and no doubt now with COVID-19. Now, talk about the, the, the two other big um, issues that have dominated both your lives, that would be republicanism and, and monarchism. Um, is, was religion a part of that, your, your views? Yeah. Well, I expect it was, because as I said, I mean, we looked, we didn't look to the Queen, we looked to the Pope, and our various saints and martyrs were not English. So I came up in a family that was very positive about what was then called England, now I guess we call it Britain, uh, and I'm a great admirer of British society. I was then and I am now, but I never thought of myself as British and I would prefer Australia to be a re Republican with, with a Republican head of state. I think that's less likely now than it was 20 years ago. So it did have, it did have an impact because we were up in a different environment. We didn't have the attitude to the king in Michael's case when he first grew up or the queen in my case. When I first grew up, we didn't have that attitude that, that others for whom the Queen was the head of their church had and for understandable reasons. So I think, I think it affected it, but there are plenty of Catholics around who are monarchists like mm. Tony Abbott. Mm. 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 Well, in the Anglican Church, of course, you pray for the Queen's Majesty. Mm. <laughs> you pray for all the members of the royal family, and I don't think they do that in the Catholic Church. No, we wouldn't do that. We used to pay, pay, pray for the conversion of what was called Russia. I guess the Soviet <laughs> Union, we prayed for that. <laughs> And I think in the oh, end we got, we got we there. got there. You got there. Although I think <laughs> the, I think well, the Orthodox benefit. I think the Orthodox benefits benefit most rather than the Catholics. But there you go. I mean, the, the, that's another division: the Orthodox division and the Rome division. Mm. That goes back even beyond the Protestant Reformation. We yeah. should have another talk on. We should that. have another talk too about communism and the, the fear of communism and how it affected both your 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 religious um, association. Well, that was important. Yeah. yeah. I think we've, we've run out of time and we want to thank both our speakers and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks, Jacqueline. Thanks, Michael.